Good morning. Welcome to the Gospel According to Kennison, and I am your illustrious host. I am your man. Good morning, Don Morin and Cheryl. You didn't even let me get through the... And Jack Friedman. <laughs> All right, well, good morning to everyone. <laughs> I am your illustrious host. Now, I want to welcome you to our program, and I do want to thank everyone that turns in and share every week we get new people. Yeah. Every single week. I do want to single out uh, Mr. Jack Friedman. He has been with us from the very beginning, actually before we even started our church. He, uh, uh, he, was, he was working at the theater, but when I did the wrote and, and uh, did the one-man play, The Gospel According to Kennison, about my family, uh, Jack was the one that uh, was running the... He and, and uh, Mike Rangel were the ones that was doing the videography and everything else during the show, so... Jack is, uh, some of my knowledge of the, of Judaism, I'll have to give credit to uh, Jack, because actually starting in that show, he would tell me some of the Jewish customs, and, uh, and I would tell him about some of the, I don't know if you call them customs, but Pentecostal customs, so Jack has been with us a long time. Uh, he's one of my best friends, he and Marcy, his wife, and his and his children, and I love him. And, uh, you know, Jack was supposed to be checking out a long time ago. Mm -hmm. He had, uh, he was diagnosed with cancer, I think, behind his eye, if I'm not correctly, Sherry. And uh, I think it was inoperable, and they said he had a, a few years or whatever. I don't think Jack's going anywhere. I don't think he's going anywhere. And, uh. We love him. We love him. I just want to say that about about Jack. Good morning, Danny James, Joe Danny Sumter. James, I'm going to be doing uh, his wife's eulogy, actually. The first time I'll ever do a eulogy on Zoom. And so I think that's next Sunday that we, uh, we're holding Danny and Sarah and his, his son that's in the services and watches our program every Sunday. We hold them up in prayer. All right, I know you want to Diana see. Lee is, is on here. Diana Lee, what can I say? And Scarlet Rose keeps calling she and had trying not found to face a, time. She had not found a better man. That could have been Mrs. Kennison. Oh, boy. But she found a <laughs> tremendous man, has tremendous children. Uh, I love Diana and her and her family and her mother and her father that have, have already Scarlet. passed, but God bless them. Good morning, right. Michael Mesmer and Jeff McLaughlin. Michael Mesmer, Jeff McG McLaughlin, uh, Michael. I follow him. He, he's an interesting. He is one of the. He has to be one of the most interesting people I've ever met, Michael Mesmer. And I remember he he did actually did several shows uh, as fundraisers in our theater. And I remember one time he was saying, you know, for those that want to come up and be hypnotized, I thought, you know, I'm going to try it. And Sherry, he threw me off the stage in my own theater. Yes, he did. You just couldn't be. He hypnotized. just said that I'm, I don't know. I don't remember what he, he was very nice about it, but I think he was telling me that I wasn't being receptive enough or something. And but I've i now I've joked about it then. I still joke about it of uh, being thrown off the stage in my own theater. Good morning to the Henrys, Bob and Kathy. Bob and Kathy. John Lutz, I, Rochelle, Phoenix Benjamin. All right. Oh, my gosh. There's so many. Misty Soper. Mitzi, yep. Love every one of them. And my granddaughter has FaceTimed me probably 10 times and doesn't remember why I can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, since it's your granddaughter, uh, let me say that today is National Grandparents Day. And that was enacted in 1978 officially and I didn't I didn't know my grand, my paternal grandparents my father's parents I never knew them I did I did have the the privilege of knowing my maternal grandparents and I love my grandmother and she had to be there I I couldn't pick between which one but her and my mother-in-law Pauline 
the fan are the two best cooks I've ever had in my life. And uh, and my grandfather, I remember uh, people used to say, well, if you want to know what Bill's going to look like at 90, take a look at his grandfather. And you know what? That's pretty true. It's pretty true. A, uh, but he is a strong disciplinarian. And a little story about him is that uh, when my grandfather was in church, he was in. And when he was out of church, he was out. And uh, when he'd been out for a while, and I didn't enjoy sitting with him in church because he was a disciplinarian. And you didn't, you didn't do anything. You sat there, and, uh, and that's how he pretty much treated me. He must have had 30 grandchildren. I don't know how many great-grandchildren on down the line. But I remember whenever he would be out of church, and when I say out of church, you know, what people call backslid, which I don't really believe in. Uh, but when he would would show up, I wanted to sit next to him. The reason I wanted to sit next to him because he came there for one reason, and that was to get back in, to renew his his vows to God. And he would sit there, and I can remember he his uh, lip would start quivering, and then he'd start weeping, and I didn't understand it then, but. Man, I just want to be next to him because uh, when next to he started feeling that, I started feeling that. It made me feel good. And uh, so I, I, I thank God for, for Matt and Mella Morrow. That was my maternal grandparents. And happy Grandparents Day to all of you. Uh, Scarlet School, uh, Friday, they had all the grandparents that could. Uh, drive through the parking lot, and all the kids were were lined up, and, and they gave you a gift. And uh, Sherry, I could see Scarlett uh, half a block away out there, and she seen our car, and she started jumping, and she had she had painted a uh, a painting for us and and written on it, and we're going to frame that. And uh, but she was so excited, and that made me excited. That made me excited. So happy Grandparents Day to all of you that are fortunate enough to have grandchildren because what they say is that the uh, greatest thing in the world are grandchildren. I thought, I love my daughter an awful lot. And I love my grandchildren, but I can't see loving anything more than I love my daughter. And then along came Scarlet Rose, and uh, man, they were right. It's a different kind of a love but now we got little Finnegan, and uh, and I, I love both of them, as you can tell. I want to get into our our program this morning. First thing that I want to do is uh, uh, nine twelve. I said a week or two ago, Sherry, that uh, I wish every day was nine twelve. And people ask why, and I said because that was a day that no one was Democrats. No one was Republicans. We were all Americans. And we were mourning. We were heartbroken. I'll never forget 9-11. I remember Sherry came in the bedroom and, and woke me up and, and said, we're being attacked. She has a habit of starting or saying things right in the middle and you had no idea and so I thought someone was attacking and trying to break in our house. So I grabbed our gun. Yes, I had a gun. And uh, she said, no, we're being attacked. Well, my next thought was we had a big tree out in the front yard. That, and I noticed the night before that there were just thousands of bees around this tree. And so I told her, because I figured they must be attacking the house. So I said, well, I'll, I'll uh, get a hold of a pest control. We'll take care of that today. No! Turn on the TV. We're being attacked. And I turned on the television. And just a few moments after I turned it on, the second plane uh, hit the Twin Towers. And I sat there in unbelief that we could be attacked on our, own, on our own soil. What was so moving, and, I, and I'm not ashamed to admit, I sat there and wept, 
And the reason I wept was is that I was watching firemen especially and policemen and other agencies, but I was watching the firemen and the policemen. And there was just a billows of smoke from the Twin Towers collapsing and this, this smoke was just billowing out and people were running to safety and I watched those firemen, over 300 gave their lives and I watched those policemen, over 100 gave their lives to save other people and what was so moving was is that they never hesitated and they knew they were probably running into their own death. They were giving their lives up to help other people. And it was, they felt it was their duty. From that moment on, and I've said on this program, how much I honor our policemen, how much I honor our firemen, and I've said that if I'm not willing to do your job, I'm not going to criticize you. You'll never hear on this program me criticize our law enforcement and our firemen because I'm not willing, I'm not willing to risk my life giving someone a ticket. I'm not willing to risk my life to go put a building that's on fire, or we, we moved from California and we had brush fires. We would share and I know what it is to be evacuated from our house because of the fires. And 9-11, uh, so sobering. I heard someone say yesterday that 25% of our population wasn't alive 20 years ago, Sherry. So they, they're never going to know probably the impact that, that, that they had on us. I remember for some reason, without anybody asking them to, uh, people came to the theater and, and united at the theater. Then they decided to have a prayer and a little talk, and of course I was elected. And there were so many that we couldn't put them in the lobby, so we actually went out on the street and stopped the traffic in the middle of the street in front of the theater. And I don't remember a lot, I think I was kind of in shock, but I remember the first words that I said with tears streaming down my face that I've never been so proud to call myself an American as I am at this moment because of the way everyone rallied to this horrendous act of terrorism. Now I'm not going to get into politics, I wish I could but I'm not, but to watch what's going on in the world today and then to find out that some of the people that were responsible for that for that act they decided while we were mourning yesterday that they would what they call inaugurate a new government in Afghanistan which I took as just a slap in the face at the United States of America. Folks, what will it take? I hope it's not another tragedy. But what will it take for you to be an American again? Just be an American. Be a Democrat secondarily. Be a Republican secondarily. But primarily, be an American for your country. We stay positive, and we're going to stay positive in the message that we give you today. And I believe in staying positive. But it's time you stood up. I don't care who your president is. 
I don't care who your Speaker of the House is. I don't care who the Senate Majority Leader is. I don't care. It's time we stood up and be Americans. Be Americans. This is the, this is the country that our children are going to grow up in. My grandchildren. This is National Grandparents Day. Your grandchildren are going to grow up in this country that we're making right now. Is this a country you want them to grow up in? Is this the political nature that you want them to grow up in? To hate people simply because they're in a different party? It used to be racist. It used to be economic positions. Now, I, uh, Sharon, I just just saw on the on the news. I don't know if it was in San Antonio or whatever, but a man and his wife shot and killed another man and his wife because they were Biden supporters. Folks, I'm telling you, let's get our heads on straight. Get our heads on straight. God love you. God bless you, and and I ask that you take this this act of 20 years ago and let it mold our thinking going forward. I want to give you some good news, Patrick Bagdon, that we've been praying for with the brain cancer. Uh, he had an MRI, and it came back, or a CAT scan, I don't know which, or maybe both, came back that uh, the cancer is not progressing, it's actually receding. And that's a victory. That's a victory. We also want to remember uh, Nancy Toll. Uh, little Chelsea was diagnosed with VHL, which is a rare genetic disease, and will be having brain surgery. If God can do this for Patrick, he can do this for Chelsea. We also had a friend that we attended church with in our theater, Robert uh, Yaramello, which... Uh, passed this week with COVID. I want to remember he and his wife, wonderful people and their family. I want to remember them in prayer. Jeanette Capuano, which is one of our closest friends, one of the best cooks I know. I don't know why I keep talking about cooking. I guess I'm hungry. But anyhow, she had to, she had, to have surgery for a, kidney, for a kidney stone this week. But she's recovering great. We've been praying for her. And she's recovering uh, nicely and, and great. Uh, I, want, I want to also mention, and I'm not going to mention his name, I had a comedian that uh, uh, contacted me, watches our program, and uh, I've known him actually for a few years, and uh, he gave his heart to the, to the Lord, he said. And he said, forces have just been fighting him. And he wanted me to counsel with him, and I, I, I sent him a little bit uh, in an email, words of encouragement. And then I asked him, I told him, I said, I would encourage you to watch our program every week. He says, I have. For the last two weeks I've been watching it, and I assume he's, he's watching today. We have, we have several people that actually contact me privately, and it's almost like i got an individual... Bible studies going on. I want to uh, mention, I want to start off this, this lesson today. I want to call it a push in the right direction. Let me give you a scripture. Job 22 and 28. You shall decree a thing. In other words, you will say a thing. And it shall be established unto you, and the light shall shine upon your ways. John, or Job 22 and 28, which is amazing because this guy lost everything. But then he received back twice what he lost. My Tennysonism to you today is give yourself a push. Give yourself a push in the right direction. Acknowledge the divine presence. Acknowledge that God in you the divine power of God in you.
Acknowledge that. As I prepared this lesson, I was reminded of a young man whose career was not going as fast as he wanted it to go. And I saw him, and he actually attended our church, and I said to him, you seem to be hesitating. What are you waiting for? And his answer to me was, Bill, I'm waiting for someone to give me a push. Whereupon I sort of preached to him the whole lesson that I'm about to give to you. I asked, I said to him, you're going to have to learn to give yourself a push. You're going to have to learn to give yourself a push. And I want you to remember that today. You have to give yourself a push. In life, you're going to have to, to do it to be successful in anything. You can't just sit around and wait for someone else to come along and help you or do what you want to do or have what you want to have. You have to, you, you're not going to have somebody that's going to come along and do that to push you in the right direction. Because if you wait for someone else to do that for you, life is going to pass you by. It's going to pass you by. I broke the habit. I broke the habit. Many years ago, I, when I decided to begin this ministry, and it's been many years ago now, over 50 years ago, I decided to write all the preacher friends of my parents. A lot of the preachers had essentially watched myself and my brother Richard grow up, and Sam had watched us grow up. I thought to myself, I'll write them and ask them to give my brother and I a push to get started. I'll write them and ask them if they'll let my brother and I preach for them to begin this ministry. And so I wrote. I wrote these preachers. And I waited for their letters to come back. And I waited, and I waited, and I didn't get a single letter, not one, not one. Finally, I, it was 2 o'clock in the morning, I'll never forget, I wrote a letter to a preacher I didn't even know. Didn't even know, but I wrote him a letter. Nobody was willing to give us a push. I finally got the letter from this pastor that I had written to at 2 o'clock in the morning that I didn't even know. And he had wrote me and said they would give us three nights in a place called Cameron, Wisconsin. Cameron, Wisconsin, the sign when we came into the little town was, population was 240 people. Richard and I had never preached a revival. I had never preached a message. I remember we drove into this, into this town, and that night we went over, and I remember the pastor's name was Robert Dorn. We went over, and we're just young guys. I'm 19 years old, Richard's 21, and never preached a revival. And I guess us being so young that the church was full. I asked Reverend Dornis how many people are here, and he said about 400. And I go, there's only 240 people in the, in the town. He said, I know. I don't know where they all came from. And so we preached those, those three nights, and we were off into the ministry. I've told you before about the church in Chicago that, that we had uh, pretty much just conned our way into and, and he invited us to preach at his church. When we started, they only had four people, so I didn't see why he let us preach there. It was actually, a, it looked like a theater, but it was, it was made for a church. And we went from there to Chicago 
And we ended up holding revival there for five weeks. Five weeks. From that moment on, I was broken of a habit of waiting for someone else to come along and give me a push. I, I was done with that. From that moment on, I didn't wait for anybody to decide for me what I could and could not do. I had a brother, Sam Kennison, great comedian. He got into the ministry. Started with Rich and I. Then when he decided to go on his own, he just was never successful. And I think the reason was is that he was never convinced that was what he was supposed to do. When finally the drop, bottom dropped out, he tried to preach for seven years. Never been successful. He came to the church that I was pastoring, a large church. And he told me what had happened. He said, I'm done. His wife had been had been caught, he caught his wife in an affair and and they decided to get a divorce and in our circles that's the worst thing could happen to you is to get a divorce. I remember I asked Sam, I said, I want you to forget that your dad is a preacher, your mother's a preacher, your friends are preachers, your brothers are preachers. I want you to forget that. Look down in your heart and find out what you have always wanted to do. Be specific. You've been a preacher because you, your dad's namesake. You've been a preacher because your brothers was preachers. Look in your heart and find out and be specific. I thought it'd take a little time. He did. It took about five seconds and said, I've always wanted to be a stand-up comedian. So I said, from this moment on, never preach another service. Never preach another sermon. Because if you do, you'll always go back. Follow what you have decided you want to do. He ended up being one of the greatest. A lot of people think he was the greatest, but he was one of the greatest stand-up comedians in history. In this lesson, I want to teach you one of the most important things that you must do in order to give yourself a little, uh, uh, give yourself a push in life. Not just a little push, a push in life. If you want to give yourself a push in the right direction, you must first set definite goals for yourself. Be specific about it. If you want to live successfully and get the good you desire, you must set goals. Some of you are just going day to day. Whatever happens, happens. No, set goals. You must decide what you want. Get in the habit of deciding exactly what, yourself, uh, what, what you want. Ask yourself frequently, what do I really want? Ask yourself today, what do I really want? And visualize in your mind the good that you desire. See it. See it in your mind. Close your eyes and visualize what you want. Ask yourself, what do I really want to be? What do I really want to do? And what do I really want to have? You would be surprised if you knew how many people never really decide exactly what they want. If you don't know what you want, if you have nothing definite in your mind, if your mind is, is a blank about the good you desire, that's exactly what you're going to get, is nothing. Be choosy. Be choosy to give yourself in the right direction you must set up positive goals for yourself. You must be decisive. Sarah and I, we've lived our life being choosy. When it came time that we wanted a new car, we just didn't want a new car. We wanted a specific kind of new car. I remember we were just young people and 
and uh, sold the the automobile I had. We had to get a new car and really couldn't afford a new car, but I never looked at that. We sat down and we said, we want a new Cadillac. Now, you got to remember that first, I think I'm about 25 years old. Sherry's about 22. We want a new Cadillac. I didn't know how. Didn't know how it was going to be possible. But I could visualize myself driving this new Cadillac. My, my father-in-law had a Cadillac and he was in Rockville, Illinois. And I remember I was helping him paint his apartment. Or he, he had a fourplex and we were painting it. He had to go over and have his car serviced over in Chicago. So we drove over. Is that you saying hallelujah or what are you saying? I'm, I'm afraid to ask you because after that finger thing. <laughs> Time for you to... Well, I'll tell about that new Cadillac you wanted. I got it. Yes, you did. We went over to... Uh, went over, I went over to Chicago, uh, the Reverend... Uh, my father-in-law asked me. I've always called him the Rev, by the way. He said, you want to go with me? Got to take me over there to get my, my car. So I said, sure. So I rolled over with him. And while we were there and they were getting finished, I was out... Walk around, I, I look like a bum. I got paint on my clothes. I look like a kid. And I'm out in the parking lot, and I'm looking around, not really expecting to buy anything that day. First, I didn't have the money. This young salesman came out. He wanted me to get off the lot. The Rev and I he had no idea that the Rev's El Dorado was being serviced. Maybe I came up to him and said, uh, you see anything you like? I said, yeah, I see a lot of cars I like. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't, we, uh, write, why don't we write one up today? Which one do you want? And I said, well, if I was going to buy a car, I want that Cadillac on the showroom floor. A white Coupe de Ville, red leather interior, I'll never forget it, Sherry. Moonroof, show you how old we are. Had an eight-track player. And uh, just beautiful. I said, I just want to buy one. I buy that one. And so he said, Well, I'll tell you what. Let's uh, let's write it up. And I go, Well, I'm not going to pay that sticker price. This is how cheap cars were back then. I think this was in 1974 or five. And that new Cadillac cost twelve thousand eight hundred dollars. I'll never forget it. So I said, I'm not paying twelve thousand eight hundred for it. And he goes, well, how much would you like to pay? I said, I'd like to pay $7,400. I don't know why I picked that number. I should have made it cheaper. $7,400. And so he said, all right. We'll write up the contract. So he's out there with his clipboard. He's writing it up. He said, now, uh, I said, I'll have to, I'd have to come back and get it. And I've got I to get a loan. So he said, that's all right. How much, how much you want to put down on a deposit? Now, I'll never forget. I reached in my pocket, and I think I had $4. I asked the rev, I said, how much money you got? And he said, you reached in his pocket, he said, I got $6. I said, okay, here, here's $10. You can hold that car with this $10. So the boy, the guy took my $10 and thought he'd never see us again. Make a long story short, Sharon and I didn't have any money. Every bank we went to in Rockford turned us down until finally I went back to the bank by the church and uh, they turned me down. I asked the lady when she called and said, your loan application has been declined because you're a minister and that's not a good risk for us. Isn't that amazing? Anyway, so I said, who makes that decision? She said, well, our bank president, Bill Condon. I said, well, I'm going to come right over then. I want to talk to him. So I remember I sat over, I went over and, and I sat down, and he was explaining to me that attorneys and, and preachers were the worst risks on giving loans to. And so I said, well, let me tell you, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have a job. And Mr. Congdon looked at me and said, uh, really? I said, yeah. Matter of fact, if it wasn't for me, 
there wouldn't be a bank here. Really? I said, yes. If it wasn't for me, there wouldn't be a world here. So now I think he's getting ready to call security or whatever, and he goes, would you please explain to me how you're so important that there wouldn't be a world? And I said, because I'm a child of God. Everything is created for my good. And Sherry, by the time we got through, yeah. he said, I'm going to give you the loan. Well, now he had to deal with the car company because when he called over and said, uh, well, we're going to draft a, uh, a draft over for this Cadillac and they, whoever it was over there went and said, we're not selling that car for $7,400. I remember he said, well, sir, you're not, you're not dealing with Reverend Kennison anymore. You're now you're dealing with uh, American, one, I forget what it was called, what the name of the bank was called then. And he said, you're dealing with us. We've already uh, got the loan. I have a document here that you received $10 deposit. And so he's going to be coming over uh, this evening and pick up the automobile. And, and we did. Now, here was the interesting thing after that. Sure, there were times that I would call him on the phone and we needed 20000 for a crusade. And he would send us the thing and go, you can sign the papers when you get here. But the most interesting thing is we paid this, this Cadillac off early and uh, they, they, you know, they give us the, all the paperwork and everything else. And I told Sherry, I said, I want you to look at this. And she said, what? I said, Mr. Comden personally co-signed my loan. He didn't just approve our loan. He co-signed it. You say, why? I was specific. I looked at that power of God within me. You can do the same thing in every part of your life. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time you've given us today. And Lord, I ask there's a little bit of what I have told them that will ground itself inside of them. Let them ask themselves, what do I really want? What do I really want to be? What do I really want to have? And you will give it to them because they can decree a thing and it will be established. Father, I ask those that need a healing today, let the healing touch of God within them rise up and cause their healing. I ask that you, you to touch their finances. I don't care what the inflation rate, everything else is. We don't live by the supply of the, of the country. We live by the supply of God that's never, never run dry. I ask that you bring them peace in this time of turmoil. I'll give you all the praise. Amen. God love every one of you. Sherry, do you love them? I love them and they I love know them. it. And uh, I guess if Sherry ever gets mad and decides she's going to help me with the program, we'll lose half our audience. Yes. Because I'm getting tired of seeing messages where they love to hear Sherry chime in. I even have one this week that said, I love when she laughs. And I'm like, what am I preaching at? Or teaching that she finds so funny, like she's laughing right now. That she finds so funny, but people love it. We love you. God loves you. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. God bless the United States of America. See you next Sunday.